Amen. Good morning. Um, we're we're going to sing a very special song this morning, and this is what worship is all about. The heart of worship is all about Jesus. Y'all stand and sing with us. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all. Deeper within, through the way things 
morning and welcome to Oak Hill. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we appreciate all of those tuning in by internet today. Thank you for joining us and I hope today that you have prepared your hearts for worship because we will do that in spirit and in truth. Uh, the, the amount of people here doesn't matter. What matters is the heart of the people here and so we want to focus on uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and allow him to speak to our hearts and may our worship uh, just go before the throne of grace and be a sweet, sweet sound to his ear today. We do have one announcement before I pray, so I'm going to ask Miss Ann if she will come and lead us in our announcement. Good morning. I'm a member of the bylaws committee here at Oak Hill, and if you notice, there are, there's a stack of uh, proposed bylaw changes. There, you can find them on the information desk out front. And if you look, th pick up a copy and look through it, the old wording uh, will be stricken out and the proposed changes will be written in bold type so you can see what is being taken out and what has been proposed to take its place. And so look through these. Um, some, some of us have probably never looked at the bylaws of the church, but it's really interesting reading and it gives you an idea of what we're about and, and how, how things go here at the church. Um, be sure to pick up a copy and look through it. And if you have any questions, you can talk to anybody on the committee. That would be myself, Brother Calvin, um, Jeffrey Wilson, Charlie Smith, and Jim Downs, I think. So anyway, if you have any questions, let somebody know and we'll vote on this in a couple of weeks. So get familiar with it, pick up your copy and look through it and see if you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Miss Ann. Would you join me as we pray? Father God, as we bow before you today, we pray for your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and lives right now. We've come into this building and we've brought many cares with us, many burdens, many worries from the outside world, from our lives, from whatever area it may be. We pray that, that Father, we will be able to cast these burdens upon you. And we pray that today we will release them and allow you to guide us, to fill us, to comfort us, to encourage us, and to stand us up on our feet where we may be able to look at the world and say, yes, we've been through tribulation, but we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore we will never, ever walk alone because he carries us through the difficulties in life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Continue to worship by singing Surely Goodness and Mercy. Shepherd, lead us. Thank you. 
mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the
Amen. Thank you for that. That was awesome. And today we're going to be looking at discouragement, five things specifically uh, that you can do to defeat discouragement. And uh, we're going to be in the, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses uh, 3 through 7. And, and, you know, it's an important, important thing to think about, to meditate on, because I think at all times, I can safely say it most times, somebody's going to be discouraged. And uh, you and I have probably been discouraged at least once this past week over uh, some issue or some happening, whether you've watched the news, that's enough to discourage anyone if you watch the news. But there are a lot of different reasons for discouragement. And I heard a person say a long time ago that if you are uh, discouraged, then you don't have faith. And I, I want to say that there may be some truth to that, a lot of truth to that, but there also, that may not be totally correct. Let me explain that to you. The reason I don't think that is totally correct is because sometimes we are overwhelmed with the immediate news or the shock that we get when we receive a certain piece of news. Whether it's your health, whether it's a circumstance in life, uh, you can be in, in a state of shock momentarily. It may take you a little bit to uh, get past that. When the emotions settle down, then you uh, can, can progress through that. When we're in that state, typically there's things that happen. You, you, I mean, your heart rate goes up. There's all sorts of things. Your mind becomes cloudy, and you're not able to think clearly. And, and those things happen, and that's just a part of, of circumstances that take hold in our lives. And we have to work through that, and then we find that when we settle down, we're able to focus on what we need to focus on, uh, typically being God. So it's not always that we have a lack of faith. And it can be, but not always, it, that's not always a result. In this passage, let me just share with you that Paul had wrote the letter to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. But in 1 Corinthians, he had wrote a letter to address some issues that they were having. One was incest. Another was uh, uh, disputes among church members. He wanted them to settle down. He wrote them uh, to uh, ha deal with those factions in, in there. And he also wrote and encouraged them to get involved more in ministry by giving to the saints in Jerusalem, by taking up an offering and giving to the saints in Jerusalem and helping them in their poverty and all of their persecution. And so he encouraged them to do that. It's important that when you focus on God or know that when you focus on God, you have less time to focus on the problems. And so that's huge. That's important. And he also dealt with false prophets that were coming in and distorting their whole concept of Christianity and their view of Paul. And Paul deals with this issue again in 2 Corinthians. He is dealing with, with some of the problems. It, it is apparent to me that when you look at, at verses 3 through 7, you see that they were discouraged. It was obvious that they were discouraged about the way things were going. Uh, when you take an in-depth look at them, you cannot help but to notice that when one problem was addressed, another one had already surfaced and, and directed their attention to something else. That kind of sounds like life, doesn't it? When you get one thing, when you get, grab one thing by the horns and you think you've got the bull by the horns, you look back and there's another one right behind you. There's always something new coming up, always. Just when you think you've got everything beat, something begins to beat on you. But it doesn't have to control our lives. I'm going to ask you to follow along with me as I read, and then we will pray and, and move further along in the message. And it says in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Blessed be, the name, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake. Now I want you to listen to this last part so also you will partake 
of the consolation. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share this message today. And I pray, knowing that we all face discouragement, I know that we have to renew our focus on you. We have to dedicate ourselves to you and, and keep ourselves aligned with you in every way possible. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. When we do take an in-depth look, we realize, again, that their problems were endless. And they, they suffered. They had already uh, suffered many things. Problems began to surface even more. And, and Paul did something kind of unique. When he uh, speaks in, in verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the mercies of, and God of all comfort. So he uses the word comfort, and that's something I want you to notice. That word means uh, encouragement. It means exaltation. And, and so it, you can also translate that word as, as uh, consolation. And so that's an important word to think about. Paul would not be trying to just encourage them over these issues had there not been an issue. I mean, he did. He was an encouraging person. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying he took it to a level that was not just your normal encouragement in an introduction to a letter. He took it a little bit further than that. Discouragement really means that, that one has lost their confidence in something or someone, and it's usually seen very easily in uh, their physical appearance. You know, you can see their countenance has changed. Uh, sometimes people will say things like this, you look tired, or you look distracted. They'll say things like that to you. By the way, don't walk up to people and say, oh, you look horrible. Don't do that. Don't, don't tell them that. Just say, uh, I'd like to pray for you. If they look horrible, just say you'd like to pray for them. Don't tell them that they look horrible, okay? Just know that there might be something going on in their life, and they don't need you to tell them how bad they really do look at that point. But also, it can be heard in our speech or recognized in our speech. Discouragement can come out uh, in, in a very uh, uh, vocal way sometimes, and not necessarily that they mean to, but it can. And it, it can also be seen in their distraction. When you're talking to someone, sometimes people are distracted. It's not that they're looking for someone else in your place, but they're distracted, and you know that they're really not listening to you. They're really not paying attention, or maybe you're in deep thought. Have you ever been uh, somewhere, or maybe at home, and you're sitting there, and someone's talking to you, specifically your wife or your husband, and all of a sudden they realize that you're not listening, and they tap you, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was in another place at this moment. I was thinking about something else. It, it captivates you, and it dominates your attention, even though someone may be carrying on a conversation with you, you're oblivious to that. Discouragement can be a difficult thing. We have, may have lost that confidence in someone or something at times. And um, you know what? Discouragement comes mostly on daily basis. Sometimes there are small discouragements. There are large discouragements. There are things that, that happen. And you will also run into people who are discouraging. By the way, if you encounter discouraging people, um, find someone else to hang around. Find someone else to associate with. There are some times when you think uh, you want to say something like, thank you for that word of criticism. There might be, uh, maybe at the end of a service, you want to call on someone in closing prayer, and you might accidentally say, hey, brother, would you lead us in a word of criticism as we close? There's some people that seem to have a gift for being negative about everything. It doesn't matter what it is. They have a gift for being negative. If you notice, if you're having surgery, someone's going to tell you that, oh, so-and-so died from that same surgery. It's always going to be someone that's going to make it much worse. They're going to bring you down, and then you're going to get cold feet. I don't know if I want to have this or not. So-and-so said their cousin on their mama's side and their nephew, so-and-so. They died from that, and, and they tell you all of these things. Don't be discouraging to people. And, and, and when you associate with people like that, Make sure that you disassociate with people like that as much as possible and look for encouraging people. You want people that's going to build you up. They may not have the answer, but they'll pray for you. They may not know what you're going through, but they'll point you to the Lord in every aspect of everything you do. Sometimes you just need to say, Hey, tell me something God's doing in your life today. Tell me something positive about what God is speaking to you, how he's speaking to you through his word and the things that are, are, are resonating with you, the things that are impacting your life. 
Tell me about these encouraging things. Because you know what? Encouragement from God's Word, encouragement from God's people, they counteract discouragement. And so we want to be careful that we do not uh, find ourselves in a place of discouragement. Now, we also can find our, ourselves there because our plans in life fail. How many, don't raise your hand, but how many of you ever thought when you graduated high school you were going to do one thing in your life, but yet everything is completely different now than it was then? You know, we, at the time, it was very discouraging, but when we look back, many times it's actually very encouraging that God took us down another path. And sometimes uh, it may not be the path that we choose, and we may have a little bitterness over the fact that we were unable to do this, experience that, or go here. But you know what? We should focus on what God has blessed us with, and he has blessed us with a lot. Now, discouragement was present in the Bible. In, not just in this passage, in the Old Testament, Jacob's wife, Rachel, in Genesis 30, she was so discouraged that she lost confidence in the fact that she would ever, may not ever have a child. She began to accept that to some degree, but yet she cried out and wept over that issue. In 1 Samuel chapter 28, now there's a lot more to the story than I'm going to tell you, but Saul consulted a medium, a witch the witch of Endor. And the reason that he did this was because the Philistines had gathered their army against them and Saul, being out of God's will, and, and he called on God and God didn't answer him. And so he became extremely discouraged and decided to find another source of encouragement. So he went to see the witch of Endor to call up the spirit of Saul. Matter of fact, she did this, but it happened to the point that I believe it even scared her when Saul said, why are you disturbing me now? And then there's Jeremiah in chapter 20 and verses 7 through 9. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet because his messages were usually... Uh, focused on, on Israel and the shortcomings, and, and it broke his heart to see his nation in the condition that they were. And so Jeremiah, in verses uh, 7 through 9 of chapter 20, Jeremiah just wanted to quit the ministry. He said this, he wanted to quit, he wanted to walk away, he wanted to move to a place of isolation. I've told people that in my life I understand why monks exist. They move on a mountain way away from everybody else so they don't have to deal with people. They don't talk to each other. They don't, even, they, don't, they don't associate with each other. They just walk in silence. But let me tell you something. That wouldn't last long for me because I'm a blabbermouth. I like to talk. And if I can find anybody to listen, I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk. And so the truth is we can't run from the evil in the world because the evil is in here. And we take evil wherever we go. Jonah was so discouraged because God wanted him to deliver a message to Nineveh of hope that he decided to run. And he caused himself some trouble, but he eventually came to his senses and, and uh, the whale spewed him out on the, on the bank and said, okay. He was, he was ready after three days in the abyss, per se, he was ready of three days underwater in the belly of a fish. After that, he was ready. He was ready to deliver the message. Discouragement is one of those things that we all deal with. There are many things in my life that I've been discouraged about. Sometimes, I'll, I'll just be honest with you, I, I, like every other pastor, get discouraged about the ministry sometimes. You know what? You get discouraged about things in church. You get discouraged about things in home. We all find ourselves being discouraged. But if we're going to defeat discouragement, I'm going to share with you five things that are very important to do that. I want you to look at verse 3. Notice what Paul did. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. The first thing he does is he directs them in their focus to God. He directs them, and he tries to comfort them and encourage them. Now, what we need to do to start with, the number one thing is we need to recognize that we're discouraged. 
Sometimes we fail to recognize our discouragement. Sometimes we move into a position where we're discouraged and it seems to carry on and carry on and carry on and we don't even realize that we're discouraged. Sometimes people don't realize that they've become so negative in the world. It's easy to do. It's easy to become negative. It's easy to become discouraged. But sometimes that happens because of failed expectations. They are a major source of discouragement. Things don't happen the way that I want them to. They don't happen in the time, uh, time frame that I want them to happen. And therefore, I'm discouraged. Lord, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Maybe it's not time. Maybe God's not ready. Maybe at the right moment, God will do something dynamic that will be completely different than anything you've ever expected. And maybe our expectations would lower what God's going to do. But God doesn't want to lower the, uh, to our expectations. He wants to raise ours to his. And sometimes we set the bar low. Sometimes we set it low. So we, we have to ask, what are my expectations? Are they reasonable? This is, what, this is what Paul said. He referred to God as the God of all mercies. That's important. Because as you're going to see when we progress through there, I want you to know that God is merciful. He is with you no matter what you're going through in life, whether it's a health crisis, a financial crisis, whether it's a, a family crisis of some other sort, whether it's a crisis at your uh, employment, or, or wherever it may be, God is the God of all mercies, and he's with you in this crisis. I've learned so much through the tribulations and crisis that I've been through in my life that I wouldn't take anything for them. Did I like them? Absolutely not. There's nothing fun about them. But if you can just focus on God, if you can just realize and, and recognize that you're discouraged and redirect your focus, God will do something in your life. The altar, they alter our plans short-term and long-term. But I'll say sometimes God brings good out of them. You know, there's things that happen in life that cause us to be more appreciative of what we have. Health-wise, financially, uh, family members. There are things that, that happen in life that cause us to realize we've taken these things for granted. That we've taken these people for granted. That we've taken life for granted. That we've taken our church for granted. That we've, that we've overlooked things and stepped away from things. Surprise events can set us back and they can stop us in our tracks, but they can also redirect our path if we simply will let God do that. We have to recognize our discouragement. Why am I so discouraged? Because it didn't happen the way that I wanted it to happen. Why am I so discouraged? Because I'm in shock over this situation that just happened, and now I'm going to come to my senses, and I'm going to, to allow God to take control of this situation. Our expectations are often suddenly changed because of tribulation, and that will lead to discouragement if we're not careful. Sometimes discouragement is short-lived, and that's a good thing because that means we've progressed past it very quickly. You see, when discouragement comes very quickly into your life, you have to process all of that. You have to, you have to work through that. Is it because you have a lack of faith? No, it's because you're overwhelmed with the immediate news of whatever it may be, and you've got to sort through that news. You've got to sort through those emotions. You've got to get through that in order to find the encouragement that you need. But the second thing is, not only should we recognize our discouragement, we should realign our focus on God. Now, if you notice in, in verse 4, he says, who comforts us, talking about the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I've mentioned this multiple times, but I need to mention it again. If we stop and look at what we've gone through, maybe whether God put us in that situation or whether God allowed that situation to happen, Maybe God 
has used that to prepare us to minister to other people in the same situation. And we can realize that when we realign our focus with God. And this is what Paul is saying. He's hammering on the fact that we have to focus on God and what we're going through, yes, it's difficult, yes, it's hard, but if we realign ourselves with God, what happens is that we will find that we focus on how God is equipping us to better minister for Him and for the cause of other people. You can relate to people who've gone through something. But I will caution you, I will caution you, don't tell people, I know exactly what you're going through. Don't tell people that. You say, well, I had the same problem they have. Yes, but you still don't know exactly what it's like. What you should say is, I've gone through something similar. And it was hard to keep my focus on God, but once I realigned my focus, I realized that God was bringing good out of my difficulties. Remember Romans 8, 28? For uh, God, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, he brings good out of the situation. All things work together for good. That's what it says. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Good comes out of it. Not that the situation itself may be good, but the results and effects of the situation bring good. It emerges. Focus on the positives and embrace the variables. Things change in life. We change. When we go through life as we get older, we change physically. There's a lot that changes. It's so many things that changes. Not only do we change in our physical appearance, but we also change in our mental state, in our emotional state. We need to focus on positives and, and embrace the variables when they come along. We just have to hang on and and sometimes just go through what is there. But we also need to realize that faith, mindset, and focus are critical in realigning your focus on God and getting your attention on God. We have to have the right mindset. Think about the prodigal son. He was off eating with, with hogs. He was off eating with, with, with pigs, swine. And he was a man who, who had had been exposed to a wealth in his life, a wealth of things. I mean, he had everything when he left home. He, he went and, and he lived with, with uh, people who, as his brother said, squandered everything away on sensual living, but we don't know that. We just know that he was in a hog, eating with the hogs, and he came to himself. And what does it mean when he came to himself? It means that he came to his senses and realized what he had given up, and he wanted to know if he could get it back. But let me tell you what happened when he returned. He returned with a greater appreciation for what he had to start with. And sometimes that is why we have tribulations in life. Sometimes they are self-inflicted. Yes, they are. Sometimes we make bad choices and we cause ourselves an, an enormous amount of trouble that could be avoidable. But sometimes that is just the way that it is. Because have you ever tried to talk to anyone that wouldn't listen? There's only one thing you can do at that point, that's step back and pray for them. Because it doesn't matter what you say. They may say, okay, they may agree with you, they may think it's right, or they may just tell you, I'm not going to do that. But either way, they're going to do their own thing until they reach rock bottom, and then they're going to open their eyes. They've got to, come to, them, to come to themselves. Now, let me tell you, Christians, that's what happens to a discouraged Christian, is we have to come to ourselves and say, God is the Father of all mercies. He is the one who comforts, and he's letting me go through this so I can comfort others. Maybe, maybe, Lord, if you'll just show me what I need to gain, what I need to experience, what I, what I can do in return, then I'll embrace it as best as I possibly can. Matter of fact, Joshua 1.9, he was about to lead the conquest, finish the conquest that Moses started. And a little encouragement came to him from God. He said, don't be dismayed. Don't, don't be overwhelmed. Don't let this thing get to you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to guide you through this. Philippians 4.13 is another reminder. You know what? When we think we can't do something, we can do it. Because Philippians 4.13 says, I can do this. But how? 
through Christ who strengthens me. I can do it not because of my own power, not because of my own ability, but because of the power and ability of Jesus Christ in me, I am able to overcome and move forward. Is that not encouraging? I can do this. I can get through this because Jesus is going to walk with me through this. To defeat discouragement, we must resolve that God is in control and that we can trust him. We can trust him. I think perhaps for me, and, and, and I will dare to say this is probably true for a lot of people, one of the things that leads to discouragement in me is the fact that I don't know the plan. That's discouraging. You know, and I'm going to tell you, one of the worst things, I like planning things out. I do. Sometimes I'll leave it to someone to plan it out, but I like knowing some of, at least some of the details. I like knowing that. If I do something, if I, I, I usually write it out. If I'm building something, I write it out. I cross it out when I, as I complete each thing. I, I do that, and, and it's important. But when I don't know the plan, it really throws me a loop. And it, and it can lead to discouragement. I have a, a close friend who built a house a few years ago. And his wife, she said to him, she said, where's the plan? And he said, right here. And she said, don't you think you need something on paper? He said, I've got it right here. And I want you to know he had it right there. But for me, that wouldn't work. He apparently ha had a good mindset of what he wanted. But when we don't know the plan, when we don't know how this is going to progress, when we don't know how we're going to get from A to B, it can be discouraging. So we have to realign ourselves with God and say that you have the plan and I'm going to follow your plan as long as your voice leads me. But the third thing is we need to release our disappointments. Now I want you to notice verse 5. It said, for as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Paul released his burdens. As a matter of fact, Jesus told us that we are to release our burdens, to take his yoke upon us, which is light and easy. We're to, we're to give him our burden and take his. He did that on the cross. But it wasn't just for salvation, it's for everyday life that we can get through the things that we face. We need to release our disappointments. We need to tell God what we're disappointed about. God knows it. Yes, he does. But sometimes we need to tell God because we're the ones that need to know it. It's not that God doesn't know it, but as I said earlier, sometimes you can't tell anyone something, and we have to realize it for ourselves, and when we realize it, we can release that disappointment. We can do it by telling God about our discouragement and ask him to show us exactly what we need to know and nothing else. Help us to focus on him. Paul wanted to go to Corinth, but he just couldn't get there. Just a lot of different things came up, and things happened that directed his, his uh, trip, and I, I mean, he wound up in jail. He, he went looking for Titus and wasn't there, so he went to Macedonia and found him there. Titus gave him a good report on the Corinthian church, and, and uh, he found that to be very encouraging, and, and, but he also told him a lot of other things, and so he called, uh, uh, wrote a letter to explain to them what they needed to do and how to move forward and get beyond that. Ask God to help you look past the pain of today into the hope of tomorrow. That's so critically important. Ask God to take the unrest and give you rest. Say, Jesus, take my yoke and let me take yours. Release the disappointments. Release them. Let them go. You say, well, preacher, that's easier said than done. Yes, I want to tell you, I'm not oblivious to the fact that letting something go is hard. I know that. And sometimes if you don't show emotions over, people are going to say, well, they don't care. Yes, it doesn't mean you don't care. You've learned how to release it. 
You've learned how to let it go. You've learned that you can't control it, so don't worry about it. Matter of fact, I believe Jesus said something about worry, that if it would add one cubit to your life, then worry, so to speak. But he said it won't, so don't worry. Don't worry about what you can't change. We need to release our disappointments. Just let it go. And, and people have found different ways to do that. They have. I, I've watched several things. I've watched people release balloons uh, for the death of a loved one, to, and, and they put a note in it, and they blow it up, and they let it go, uh, things like that. And you say, well, that's crazy. Maybe it is. But let me tell you, if it helps you get to a point of resolving your discouragement, let a balloon go. I've seen people plant a tree in, in honor or in memory of someone because it gave them a little bit of consolation. It wasn't that they were trusting in a tree, but that tree is a reminder to them as they see it that they released that disappointment and that burden. But then we also, the fourth thing is you need to renew your spirit. Now this is critically important. If you notice verse 6, he said, now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for uh, enduring the suffering. Or, if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Paul said, either way, either way, either way, we suffer. It's for the good of Christ in your life and in my life. Either way, it's there. Renew your spirit. And you say, well, what, what do you mean by that? First, as I've already said, avoid negative people. If people are always discouraging you, I'm not saying you need to throw them under the bus, but try to avoid spending a lot of time with them. Try to, try to avoid that. You say, well, I work with someone negative. Well, I, I, there's not much I can say to you on that. I understand you have to have income. Don't quit your job because you work with someone negative. Just simply focus on God. Be that person that doesn't hear when someone else is talking to you. <laughs> Just shut them out. Don't hear the negativity. Process it. Consider the source. It is difficult to renew your spirit when you're always around negative people, people who are complaining and whining about everything. But I also want to mention this. Avoid isolating yourself. There's a tendency among people who are discouraged to isolate themselves from other people. They want to withdraw. They want to get alone. And now, now, there are times when we need to get alone. There are days when I like to get alone. I, I've learned the value of leaving my cell phone in the house while I do things in the yard. I've learned the value of that. I've realized that people will survive if I don't answer their call immediately. I've realized that. No one's died as a result of that. There are times when I've, I've driven to town and I've left my phone at home by accident, and I think, I've got to turn around and go back and get my phone. No, I'm going on and I'm doing what I want to do, and then I'm coming back. It'll be okay. Sometimes we have to get away. We need a little time to process things, but that's not what I'm referring to when I refer to isolation. When I refer to isolation, I mean that we separate ourselves from everybody and everything that not only discourages us, but could encourage us. You know, in 2020, we went through this time. We went through a time of isolation. It seemed that after we went through the po political pandem uh, pandemic of 2020, that the isolation was the big central theme. That was the core, the nucleus of everything about the pandemic was that you had to isolate yourselves. They didn't want people interacting. They didn't want people going to church. They didn't want people participating in anything. Our churches shut down. And what I noticed, that our department store stayed open. The restaurants stayed open. I never could figure out how you had to wear a mask in a restaurant because it was unsafe to walk by people, but you could take your mask off when you sat in the booth beside them or behind them or in front of them. Magically, it's safe. And even when the world opened back up, guess what? People did not feel safe at church. But they felt safe everywhere else. They go on vacation, they do these different things. It was okay to have company, but you just couldn't go to church. Let me tell you what that is. That's the devil 
trying to discourage Christian folk. And I'm going to tell you why. Because he knows if he can keep us apart, then he can cause discouragement in our lives. But if we want to be encouraged, you need to be in the house of God around God's people. Now, I'm not oblivious to the fact that we have sometimes experienced negativity in church. I realize that. Don't focus on the negativity that you may hear from one or two people. Focus on the encouragement that you get from others. You see, there's a lot of encouraging things that happen in the church. Sunday school, worship, prayer, preaching, there's invitation, the, the, the fellowship we have with one another. All of these things are encouraging to me. Yes, there are days when you may not feel like coming, but when you come, you leave. In most cases, you're very glad that you came. You're glad, you're excited that you came. And, and so we, we tend to separate ourselves and isolate ourselves from the things that are most important while we remain involved in the things that have no importance at all. Because let me be honest, it doesn't matter if you eat out or not. It makes no difference. You can eat at home. But when the house of God is open, you really ought to worship because you will find encouragement there. Church is an important place for renewing your spirit. Church people will, will pray for you. They're not immune. You're not immune to discouragement. But they will pray for you. They'll pray with you. And sometimes people will notice the discouragement in your life. They may not say a word to you, but they may pray for you. And so I, I will say, be careful. Be careful that you don't avoid the things that can renew your spirit. Get in God's Word. Read God's Word. Do devotions. Pray. Focus on God. And, and, and don't just read a verse to, to say, I've read it. Read a verse and ask God to speak to you as you read that verse. Or a passage or, or whatever it may be. Whether it's a chapter or two chapters or an entire book if you want to read it. Or the entire Bible. Just focus because you will find this, that you're not alone. And so the people in the Bible, they didn't walk through their discouragements alone. They walked with other people. God often encouraged them to go on, and he, t he told them this. He told Joshua this, you will not be alone. In Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6, uh, verse 8, it says that don't be dismayed. God will never leave you nor forsake you. God wants you to know that you're never alone, and this is important because being alone further adds to discouragement. But God doesn't want you discouraged. If we can see nothing else in life, if we can just see God, we will find some encouragement. Maybe, maybe one day in your life you're discouraged. Maybe you just need to say, Lord, I don't know what, but bless me some way today that I can see some encouragement. Send some encouragement into my life in some way or another. You know what will usually happen? You'll get some encouragement some way or another that day. That's an important thing that we should focus on. When we are in the presence of other believers and we experience corporate worship, we experience Bible study, we experience prayer, we find that we're encouraged, and this is why, because our attention is not on the problems that we have, but the one who's able to carry us through our problems. Our attention is on Jesus, and that's what matters. We must change our mindsets, and worship will do that, and we must change our focus from the situation to the Savior. Worship does that. But the fifth and final thing is we, as I've mentioned just a moment ago, that we need to remember that we're not alone. Not only has people in the Bible went through problems that we go through, you are probably sitting by someone or close to someone or around someone has gone through something similar to what you've gone through. I've learned in life that we can't truly understand or appreciate what people go through until we've experienced it ourselves. When we go through it, it becomes real. I tell people before that I, I'd never been sick in my life until really 2011. I never really had any issues. And then when I got sick in 2011, it changed my ministry. And I'm going to tell you why. And then I'm, I'm going to close in a minute. 
I'd always walked into a room and looked at someone from a perspective that was the only way I'd ever seen things. I looked at the bed, okay? I'd never been in the hospital bed. But after 2011, having been in the hospital bed, I saw things from a different view, a different perspective. And it changed the whole dynamics of the way I approach a person in a room now. It is important, and it is serious. People will say, well, it's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. Any surgery is a big deal. Someone told me, they said this, you know what the difference between major surgery and minor surgery is? I said, no. They said it's major if it's me and minor if it's you. And that's the mindset that we have a lot of times. But when you lay in the bed, when you've gone through the surgery, then you realize the minor part's gone and it's all major. It's not just an effect on your body. It's an effect on you emotionally. It affects you spiritually, and it enlightens you. And we need to know that we are never alone. Maybe you're going through anesthesia. God will hold your hand through it. The way that I've dealt with my anxieties of surgery in the past was this. I'd usually joke with the medical staff when they come in because underneath all of that was the exterior to cover up the the anxiety and so one day an anesthesiologist walked into my room and uh, he was going to he was proceeding to tell me what all he was going to do and how we were going to do this and I said well, wait just one minute I said I need to ask you a question he said what's that I said have you ever killed anybody he said absolutely have you and I said no but I have thought about it he said well we're going to be fine <laughs> and and then when I went into the operating room I was awake. That's the only, I've been in the operating room a few times. That was, I was awake. And so he starts giving me these medications, and I said, wait, wait a minute. Before you, before you put this in me, tell me what this is. He said, well, I'm giving you about 11 medications. I said, well, start with number one and stop with number 11. Tell me what they are and why I have to have them. He got to number six, and he said, this one is for amnesia. I said, what do you mean amnesia? He said, so you won't remember anything, and that was the last thing I remember. So apparently it worked. Sometimes we try to hide our discouragements. Even from God. Don't hide them from God. God knows it. Yes, I'm discouraged. Yes, I'm discouraged over the state of our country. Yes, I'm discouraged over the evil and the, and, and the things that are going on around the, not only in our country, and around the world. Yes, I'm discouraged sometimes because I've let myself down and I feel like I, I've not accomplished what I need to accomplish for God. So yes, I'm discouraged over those things. Yes, I'm discouraged when a health crisis comes into my life. Yes, I'm discouraged when, when situations happen to a family member. Yes, I'm discouraged when, when things don't go as I planned. Yes, I'm discouraged. But Paul said, let me encourage you with these words. God is the God of all comfort, and folks, we can stop right there. He is the God of all mercies. He is the only one that can help us through whatever we're facing in life, but we've got to focus on Him in order to get through it. But you and I have to be willing to give ourselves over to Him, to yield ourselves to Him, and allow Him to work. Are you willing are you ready? Don't face your troubles alone. Face them by holding the hand of God and walking through them with Him. He will open your eyes and you will be able to see as you've never seen before. Today, if you're going through troubles in life, maybe you want to come down in a moment and Sit on the front row, come and kneel down. You want to come and, and pray with me. Whatever your need is, God can meet that need. But don't leave here discouraged. Maybe you've been struggling over salvation for a long time and, and uh, you don't really know what to do and you've been discouraged because this person said that, this person said this. And, and maybe today is the day you want to come and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And I want to encourage you to do that. Maybe today that you're looking for a church home. Whatever your need is, 
God can meet that need, and he is the only one that can give you the encouragement that you desire and the encouragement that you need. So as God leads, respond to him. Would you stand with me as we get ready to close in prayer? Or move into our invitation in prayer. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to share this message. And I know that discouragement is something that we all deal with on a regular basis. And there are days when our discouragement is just overwhelming. When we've lost confidence in, in, in whatever it may be, in whomever it may be, we've lost total confidence. I just pray that that is not a loss of confidence in you. Because, Father, I know that even when we're discouraged, you're at work in our lives, and we just have to be able to see that. And I pray through the power and presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, that we will find the strength and encouragement to just move forward in another day. Remind us that I can do this through Jesus who strengthens me. I can face these problems. I can face these situations. I can overcome through you. Father, today in this invitation, I ask you to work in the hearts of the ones here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As the invitation begins, come and respond to the Lord Jesus as you need to. It's all about him. Yield yourselves to him and let him encourage and fill you with his spirit of renewal. Come. Come, every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy. Come, come. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to Amen. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks to those that have joined us on live stream. We're so glad that, that you joined us, and uh, we hope that you will connect with us again. Uh, remember, the Lord loves you. I love you. Thank you, Mr. Danny. I was waiting on that, and, and go out and be a missionary in this world. I know that you, we're about to go to different places. Go and be a missionary. Uh, don't just tell people about Jesus. Model it and let people see Jesus in you. At this time, I'll ask Brother Jimmy Harvey if he'll come and dismiss us in prayer. Almighty Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being in your house of worship this morning. We thank you for the beautiful music we heard singing praises to our Lord Christ. And we thank you for this wonderful message that Dr. Calvin delivered this morning, reminding us that when we go through trials and troubles, not to be discouraged, but to turn up the bar in our daily living, get in the scripture, and turn it all to our merciful Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the power and prayer, and we pray that as we leave Oak Hill that we'll take this message with us so that others we know who are in times of troubles, and we can be a witness and tell them that Jesus is there for us in our time of need. 
It is all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.